Converting the soul The testimony of the Lord is sure Making wise the simple The statutes of the Lord are right Rejoicing the heart The commandment of the Lord is pure Enlightening the eyes The fear of the Lord is clean Enduring forever The judgments of the Lord are true And righteous all together More to be desired are they than gold Yea, than much fine gold Sweeter also than the honey and the teach you a new song tonight and hopefully that'll be a blessing to you okay but let, let's go to verse number 14 of the same chapter psalm chapter number 19 and verse number 14 i want to read the rest of that it says moreover by them the law of the lord moreover by the law of god the commandments and the statutes uh by them is thy servant warned and in keeping them there is great reward who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And then verse number 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable or right in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Hello, Brother Paul. Appreciate you joining us tonight. All right, sing with me in verse number 14 of Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be right in thy sight, O Lord, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be right in thy sight, O Lord, for you. Psalm 19 and verse number 14. So it's always good to sing and make melody to the Lord, singing the psalms and the hymns and spiritual songs. And, uh, uh, you know, th this is the songs that uh, they sang uh, in the old days. They sang the, the, the psalms. Uh, they sang the spiritual songs and the, sang the songs of Moses and the, uh, the songs of Miriam and the different uh uh, the different prophets, and uh, and th and that's how they rejoice, and that's how they praise the Lord. Uh, now we've turned worship and praise into a business, and now uh, you know singing groups are traveling all over the country and all over the world, and they're flying here and there and driving buses and making thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, uh, all in the name of the ministry and the gospel, and all in the name of uh, of religion. And uh, I think it's a tragedy that we've that we've run into that. Uh, we don't know what the Bible says anymore because we don't sing the Bible. We don't sing the scriptures. And so uh, I want to thank George and Kathy Abbas uh, from Denver, Colorado for getting us started uh, in singing the Psalms many years ago. And uh, what a blessing that they have been to Sharon and I and to our family. And uh, so if they're ever watching and uh, if, they're, if they ever pay attention to our, our videos, Brother George, Miss Kathy, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your service and thank you for your fellowship and your faithfulness. Well, if you got your Bibles, let's go to the book of Romans tonight. We're going to continue on. I got my tea, amen. I got my little winter cup, my little penguin with the uh, snowflakes. Not much snow around here. These uh, these parts, the trees are budded and uh, it's time to uh, time to get things going with, uh, yeah, we already mowed the yard one time. You know, here it is just the first part of March. Of course, I didn't mow the yard. I'm not allowed to. Miss Sharon won't allow me to mow the yard. That's that's her job. She likes to mow the yard and do the do the trimming and all that kind of stuff. And I just sit back and just watch and just supervise. Amen. Actually, she makes me mow the out by the highway uh, because it's a little bit of an embankment and she don't want to tip the tractor over. So you know, it just it is what it is. So Romans chapter number two. We're continuing on in our study 
uh, of the book of Romans. I, I, I'm going to tell you that the book of Romans is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and, and I hope you stay with us and hang with us. I don't think it's going to be as long as it was last week. I uh, had a lot to cover, and so uh, uh, this week may not be as lengthy. Uh, we've already been in the Word tonight. We had our uh, Torah Bible study tonight and, uh, and all, already started the uh, Sabbath. And, and uh, some of you guys give me some, uh, some ideas. Uh, send me some messages or some instant messages or some texts or something. How do you do Sabbath whenever the time changes? I mean, the way that we've always done it is we just basically stop at 6 o'clock at night and go to 6 o'clock the next night. I mean, if we did that, uh, if we didn't do that, you know, in the middle of summer, it'd be 9.30 going on 10 o'clock before we would stop for Sabbath. Uh, and um, yeah, I know the Bible's very, you know, very clear about things and our time, our clocks and our time schedule and everything's all messed up with the springing forward and falling back with the, with the time changes. Give me some ideas, you know, uh, send me some messages uh, some things that I, that we can consider, but uh, right now, as far as the unless the Lord shows me another way, He always shows me another way to do it. We're going to continue stopping at six o'clock at night to six o'clock uh, on uh, on Saturday night, and that'll be our our Sabbath time. Broadcast will still be on Friday night at eight thirty, and uh, Father willing, April the sixth, April the sixth will be uh, the last night of, uh, of Unleavened Bread for us, and we're going to be celebrating with the church in Garden City, Kansas. We're going to be there. Uh, Miss Sharon and I are going to be there uh, for on April the 6th. got a big, big schedule plan for that night. We hope that you'll come. There's going to be a lot of things going on uh, and going to have a great time uh, fellowshipping together. That'll be on April the 6th, Friday night. Garden City, Kansas. Uh, we'd love for you to come. Uh, friends of ours that are in the Kansas area, come see us. Uh, we'd love to see you again. Amen? All right, so Romans chapter number two. I want to go back and I want to sort of uh, bring us up to speed and go back and, and, uh, and understand what the basis for Romans uh, is and what the actual the theme of Romans is found in verse number five of chapter number one, like we had said before. Uh, where it says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Uh, probably the, the, the biggest problem we have in modern Christianity is a lack of obedience, obedience to the faith. And Paul lays that out, uh, and he reiterates it at the, in chapter 16, at the end of the letter. Remember, this was a letter. This was not broken up in chapters until uh, uh, about the, the Geneva Bible translation, about 1560. Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, chapters and verses and things like, like that. And so it's just a letter. I mean, it's a letter just like you would write to a, to a friend like we used to years ago. I would write Miss Sharon Love letters when I was in the Army, and I'd, I'd send them to her, my own handwriting, and, you know, X's and O's and all this, I love you, miss you kind of, kind of stuff. And uh, that's what this is. It's a letter. And Paul lays the foundation for his letter in verse number five of chapter one, obedience to the faith. And then he doubles down in verse number 17 when he says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The just shall live by faith. Remember we said that the word just means lawful. The word just means lawful. The lawful shall live by faith. And then he goes on into detail uh, and the indictment on sinners and the unrighteous and the ungodly and how they will perish and are worthy of death. And, and, and then in chapter number two, we dealt with where, where, where Paul continued on where his indictment to Israel and their hypocrisy. And we came down to verse number 13 where it says, for the hearers, chapter two, verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just or lawful before God, but the doers of the law. Now the Peshitta, my friend, brother, brother Keith Pardell got me a Peshitta. Now Peshitta is, is, is the New Testament in Aramaic, okay? The New Testament originally was in Aramaic and it was translated into Greek. And uh, uh, he, he, he got me a, a, a Peshitta and it's, it's quite interesting. Here, the Aramaic uh, refers to the law as the written law. It says the hearers of the written law are not righteous ones before God, but the doers of the written law are justified or, are, or, or, or shall be justified. And then we're going to begin in verse number 14 tonight. 
uh, of chapter number two of the book of Romans, going to read all the way through the end of the chapter to uh, going into verse, uh, uh, verses one and two of chapter three uh, and uh, try to get as much covered tonight as we can. So uh, verse number 14, uh, we'll, we'll begin there. It says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, according to my good news. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of Elohim, or God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou Elohim or God? For the name of Yahweh is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For the circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcised. Remember, he's talking to the Jews there at Rome. He's talking to the, the circumcision party and those that boast on their physical circumcision and they boast the fact that they are circumcised Jews but yet they are what, what Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter number 23, uh, they're, they're, they're liars, hypocrites, and snakes and vipers. He goes on to say in verse 26, therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall, or therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God, or Elo Elohim. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of Elohim. For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of Elohim without effect? And so Paul, continuing his, his uh, message here to the Jews there at Rome concerning their hypocrisy, uh, concerning their their sin and their wickedness and their ungodliness as they considered themselves teachers of the blind, leaders of the, of the foolish, instructors of foolish, teachers of babes, but yet they have a form of the knowledge and the truth and the law, but yet they themselves do not obey and are not obedient to the faith, as Paul said there in chapter number one and verse number five. The Jew or the Israel there in chapter three, verses one and two, they have the oracles. The, the, the Hebrew, the Israelite, remember a Jew was only of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. There was 12 tribes, okay? There was actually, uh, there was actually uh, 13 or 14 that, that was considered because you had the half tribe of Manasseh, half tribe of Ephraim, okay? But nevertheless, there was more than just two, two tribes. Judah and Benjamin made up the Jews. Yet all the rest of them were dispersed out through the land, but yet the Hebrew, the Israelite, they got the oracles of God. They got the law of God. They got that which was given to them by God, by Elohim, by Yahweh, with his own hand. We just read that tonight in our, in our Torah study uh, in Exodus chapter 30 through 34. We were, we were looking at that again, how, how that Moses came down the mountain and he broke the tablets when they were building the, uh, the, the golden calf, or after they'd built the golden calf and rose up to play and corrupted themselves and and then God uh, uh, had Moses cut out another set of tablets, and he, he wrote the covenant, wrote the commandments back down 
uh, on that tablet. But if the Gentiles there showed the work of the written law, as the Peshitta says, or performed the written law by their nature, they would be the written law to themselves. Remember what Paul said back in chapter number 1 about, about, uh, 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 about what nature shows us? In verse number 20 of chapter 1, he said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and majesty, so that they are without excuse. Well, he goes on to say there in, uh, in chapter 2, he says, If the, uh, if the uh, Gentiles there, uh, in verse number 15 or verse or 14 he said if they have not the law but yet they themselves perform the law in their nature are they not a written law unto themselves because it would be shown in their hearts not in an outward show of religion you see paul continues his indictment of the religious jews and their outward shows of religion and pomp and circumstance without having yahweh's written law in their heart uh, if you'll go back to Matthew chapter number 23, Matthew chapter 23, you'll see uh, how Yeshua did the same thing. He, uh, he had the same indictment, the, the woe to the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, great chapter. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 33. Verses 1 through 33 of Matthew 23. Again, I'm reading from the Restored Names King James Bible. It mentions Yeshua Messiah, not Jesus Christ. And so when you hear me say Yeshua Messiah, you know I'm talking about, in the Greek, Jesus Christ. Uh, those of you that don't, don't understand this, um, the, the letter J did not enter our English language until after 1600. I have a, a copy of an original 1611 King James and there's not a J to be found, okay? The J did not come until after that was printed in, um, in the, towards the middle part of the 1600s. And so uh, the name Jesus Christ was not, was not in, in use. His name is Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah, okay? So uh, verse number one of Matthew 23, then spake Yeshua to the multitude and to his disciples, saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Let me give you an example of this. They added law or fences around the 613 laws of God. Okay, They added fences. And one of those fences was it was it was unlawful, and you violated God's law if you spit on the ground on Sabbath, because your spit could could uh, come in contact with a seed, and it would germinate and would grow, and thus you'd be guilty of working and doing agriculture on the Sabbath. That's a that's a heavy burden that that cannot be borne. Uh, Yeshua goes on to say, verse number five, he said, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They, they, they put the larger bands on their arms and they put the box on their head that's got the, got the Torah, the, the law of God, and they, they make their zit seats on their, on their robes and on their tallits. They make them longer so people can see how great and fantastic their their zitzits are and their tassels and, and they, they, they enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi, pastor, reverend, father. You follow what I'm saying? But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Messiah, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Messiah. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater judgment. They stand and, and O oh, great God Jehovah, O oh, Lord God of Korea, and they don't they don't talk like that normally. They don't talk like that normally. They're, it's all it's all made up. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater judgment. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of Gehenna. The English Bible says hell than yourselves. Verse 16, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of Yahweh and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, these ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the judgment of Gehenna or the judgment of hell? And when we read those verses, I mean, that is a scathing indictment to the Pharisees by our master, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, where he absolutely calls them out for their hypocrisy. He calls them out for their, their great boasting knowledge, but yet they have no spirit within them. It's all about the letter of the law and nothing about faith and nothing about the heart. It's all about the outside appearance and nothing about the inside. Hey, look, I've been an independent Baptist for 30, 32 years, okay? I was raised a Southern Baptist, but we went independent in 1986, okay? So I know how a lot of these people think. They put on their Sunday best. They put on their robe of righteousness and their cloak of righteousness to go to Sunday church. And yet when they leave Sunday church, they live like the devil, talk like the devil, act like, like the devil Monday through Saturday, and then they run back into church on Sunday, jump up into choir, sing, oh, how I love, love Jesus, and then they drop a few dollars in the off, offering plate and make themselves out to be something real spiritual, and then right back to their regular life. That's what Yeshua was talking about. And that's the type of religion that we have in America today. That's the type of religion. We've got fancy salesmen in three-piece suits. We've got men uh, uh, like uh, Joel Osteen who are absolutely deceiving the millions uh, and the Rick Warrens and, and, and the T.D. Jakes uh, and the uh, uh, Kenneth Copelands uh, and uh, the, uh, all of those uh, uh, Creflo dollars and, and, and even those within our own community. 
that stand in pulpits and they they preach a uh, a watered down gospel, uh, one two three pray after me and everything will be okay and 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 just look right, you know, make sure that you know, make sure you got the right kind of clothes on and 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 women, you're going to go to hell if you're wearing them britches and 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 you need not have that facial hair on your face and and you better get get rid of them wire rim glasses and and you quit listening to that contemporary Christian music and it's it's all over the map. And they're making their own righteousness and broadening their phylacteries and in, in, uh, enlarging the borders of their garments in order that they may look religious and seem religious. But you know what? I, I've said this for years as a pastor. Who you are in private is who you are. Who you are when nobody else is around is who you really are. And Paul brings that out in Romans chapter number two. He basically brings them out. He says, uh, "He says uh, you you behold that that you're a Jew." And verse number seventeen, and and you rest in the law, but it was it was their own fashioning of the law because remember they had added to the law. Now remember, we're going to find out in the book of Romans that Paul talks about seven different laws. Okay, but they were resting in their law, their Talmudic and rabbinic law. They rested in their law and, and they, they boasted of, of themselves and strutted around like the peacock and the cock of the walk and making themselves out to be something that they really weren't. And then Paul says there in verse number 18, and, and you know his will and approve us to things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. And you are a, you're confident that you are a guide of the blind and a light of them that are in darkness and an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge and a truth of the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, teachest thou not thyself? Now I'm going to say this to preachers, okay? I can do this because I are one, amen? Preachers are probably the world's worst of saying one thing in the pulpit and living another one, living another in their life. I know preachers that, that preach one way on Sunday and they live another way on Sunday night. They walk out of the pulpit and they become a totally different person because they're going to preach you a law and they're going to preach you a certain standard that, come, that comes with their doctrine or comes with their denomination or it comes with their bylaws, but yet they themselves are not going to hold to that standard and they themselves are, are not going to abide by that law. That's who Paul's talking about here in Romans chapter number two. It's hypocrisy. It goes into deep, deep hypocrisy. Paul describes them here much like Yeshua described them in Matthew chapter 23. You see, serving and believing is all about the heart. It's always been about the heart. Um, I preached a message years ago. I, I, I keep many messages in, in little, little binders, okay? I write my messages in these little notebooks. And I've got, I've got you know, quite a few of them in a file. And uh, my wife's laughing at me. Uh, she says a whole a whole file drawer full of them, uh, but it talks about basically I I I preach message on what heart does God see, what type of heart does God see, and I referred to First Samuel chapter sixteen verses one through seven where where uh, uh, God told told Samuel to go to the uh, the house of Jesse, and he was going to show him the new king because Saul had done been rejected because Saul uh, had been an absolute disappointment to God, you know. And so he went to he went to Jesse's home and he started looking at the at the big boys and the older guys. He started looking at the, the handsome ones. Because remember, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else, and he was handsome, he was big, he was strapping, and he was he looked like a king. And Samuel kept going down the line and, and Yahweh kept saying, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. And it, it, is there none other? And he said, well, there's, you know, David, he's out there, you know, tending the sheep, but it's surely not him. And, and brought him in, and Yahweh said, that's, that's the one. Because the Lord don't look upon the exterior, but he looks upon the heart. It's all about the heart thing. And, and, and the question remains, what kind of heart does God see in us? What type of heart does he see in us? Does he see a, uh, does, does he see a, a heart that's soft uh, and pliable and, and teachable? I remember, my, remember my, my, my friend, Brother David Johnson, there in, uh, in Atwood. He made a great statement years ago, and I never forgot it. He said, before anybody can ever move forward with the Lord, they got to be teachable. 
Problem is, most Christians, they aren't teachable because they think they know it all. Hey, guess what? We have not arrived yet. We do not know it all. I am learning something new every day. What kind of heart does God see in us? Does he see a soft heart? Does he see a heart that's tender and kindly affection and gentle and meek and humble? Remember what that verse of Scripture says there in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. The word humble means to submit to God's authority. Do you realize you have to have the right heart to submit to God's authority in your life? you got to have the right kind of heart. What kind of heart does he see? Does he see a, a, a heart that is humbled at the presence of God? Is he, uh, do we see a, a, does, does God see a heart that's open to learn the truth about God's word? Or does God see one of those deceitful and hard-hearted persons like Paul describes here in the, in the book of Romans? Notice what else Paul says there. He says there, there in verse number 23, he says that thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou Elohim. You make your boast that you're righteous. You make your boast that, oh, man, I got it going on. I'm, you know, man, praise God, we got this thing over here. And man, I thank God I'm saved. Why are you saved? Well, because one day I went down to that altar and I got down on my face and I prayed. I asked God to save me. Okay, where's obedience? Where's obedience? Where's, where's repentance? Hello, there's got to be repentance. It's one thing to confess, but there's got to be repentance along with it. Confession and repentance. The first act of obedience is repentance. The first act of faith is obedience to, to repent. But Paul goes on to talk to them here about their, their hypocrisy. He says in verse 24, For the name of Yahweh is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision or the Gentiles keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision or his Gentileness be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee or you, hip, hypocrite, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Now here it, here it is. Here it is. He's not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. It's of the heart. The Lord talks about, about circumcising our heart and, and, and cutting off the, the spiritual for, foreskin of our heart that we be pliable and, and, and workable and usable for God's glory. But that's never going to happen if we, if we don't have the right heart. Hey, look, we can know the Ten Commandments. We can have all the scriptures memorized. We can know it, one, two, three, pray after me. We can know all of that. We know how to do it. We can do it in our sleep. We know how to play church. We know religion. We know the songs to sing by heart. We know the stand to your feet, by your heads for prayer. We, we know the routine. We know what, what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it. We've got it all memorized. We've got it all mimeographed. It's Xerox right here in our brain. Just tell me, just, you know, you know what, what time of service is going to start, and, and we can do it. And there's so many people that's got the head knowledge, but their heart has never been circumcised for the truth of God's word. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. I remember when we first went to Kansas in 1992, um, we didn't have a lot of people check on us. You know, I was thinking, man, surely somebody's going to be calling me every week to make sure I'm doing all right. You know, the funny thing about it is, is once we, once we surrendered our life to the Lord and we renewed our relationship with the Lord and we got in church on a regular basis and we got to serve the Lord and trying to live for God and Man, we, we put away Halloween and, and, and then we started living right and started acting right and started, started reading our Bible and started trying to do the right things. And we went to Kansas to start churches and nobody called and nobody checked up on me. Do you know nobody checked up on me to make sure I was still 
reading my Bible. Nobody called me to make sure I was still tithing. Nobody called me to make sure I was still going to church to preach. Nobody called. Nobody called to make sure I was going to be at church on Sunday or Wednesday night. Nobody called. Nobody called. Nobody checked on me. You know why? Because they'd already seen my heart. I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. It's all about the heart. People do what people want to do. And people act the way people want to act. And if you want to live for God and you want to do the right thing and you want to be obedient, you will be because it'll be in your heart. It'll be in your desire. It'll be the desire of your heart to please our Heavenly Father. It's right there. He is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is not in the flesh, but it's in the heart. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Serving and believing is all about the heart. You know, there's a lot of people that make professions of faith. They 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 get stirred up in an emotional uh, religious meeting. They get stirred up with the emotion of the preaching and the singing, and somebody starts singing one of those tear jer jerker songs about. Grandma or mama's done gone off to heaven and well, wouldn't it be nice if we got to see her again and, and boy, it just stirs your, your emotions and you get to weep and you get to crying and then you run down to a, to a, to a platform and you fall down and you, you say, I want to get saved, I want to get saved, I want to get saved and, and you, you pray that prayer and you, you receive Jesus in your heart. Where, that, where, where, where that's found in the Bible, I have, have, have not found that yet. But but you you ask Jesus to come into your heart and 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 then 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 pray, praise the Lord you're you're saved and on your way to heaven. Walk out the door and go live your life like you've been living before. I you know I'm under grace. Hallelujah. Now I mean I'm not saying everybody does that way because I mean I got saved and I I, I had a heart change. There's a lot of people that that make profession of faith they don't have a heart change. Like Paul said in Titus, they profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. It's in the heart. Serving and believing is all about the heart. It's not an outward religious act. It's not an outward religious act. That's, that's what Paul's talking about in Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Uh, works of righteousness there that he's talking about. He's not talking about works of the law and, and works of the commandments and statutes. No, he's talking about works of building our own righteousness. You know, we're at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but we're at, every time the doors are open and we're, we're going out on, on soul winning and we're on the bus route and we're doing this and we're doing that, we're at the ever, and, and all that's fine and good, but that don't, that don't cut it. That's not, that's not works of, that's not righteousness of God's commandments and, and God's law. Not in outward, outward religious acts, but sincere faith that walks out Yahweh's law and commands out of a heartfelt respect for Yahweh and a desire to please him. We do not walk out his law to be saved, but we walk out his law and his commandments because we are saved and because our heart has been changed. We've made the first step of obedience. We've repented of our sin. We've turned, and now we have a desire to walk in accordance to his way. Remember what Yeshua Messiah said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. Paul said, as I follow Messiah, you follow me. As I follow Messiah, you follow me. Thank you, Brother David. Thank you, all those that are saying amen out there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You, you got me fired up. Amen. Now, I was reading some, some Matthew Henry comments on this verse of Scripture, and they're very good. Matthew Henry, I, I don't believe Matthew Henry was a Sabbath keeper. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But I believe that he believed in repentance. Uh, according to what he writes, he believed in repentance and and, and he believed in, in obedience, but I, I, I don't think that he kept the feasts and I don't think that he, he uh, followed the, the Sabbath. You know, um, everybody can't be perfect, amen, you know. Uh, but he's got some great comments and got some great thoughts. Uh, he, says, he says, a believing, 
humble, thankful glorying in God is the root and sum of all religion. Let me say that again. A believing, humble, thankful glorying in God is the root and sum of all religion. But proud, conceited, boasting in God and in their religion and in their outward profession of his name is the root and sum of all hypocrisy. Remember, it's not about me or you, it's all about him. He goes on to say, he said, many despise their more arrogant neighbors who rest in a dead form of godliness. How many of us have, how many of us have even said it? We've heard it. Oh, you know that crowd across town here, they're dead and they're dead at three o'clock in the morning. They're drier than last year's corn shucks. You don't want to go over there because they ain't got the power. They ain't got the spirit. Now you need to be here. You hear me talking like a like a southerner? Hey, it's easy to pick back up once you get around these folks, amen. <laughs> My wife's laughing at me. It is true. Boy, if Aaron was here, if Aaron was living back in North Carolina, boy, she'd oh boy, she'd pick it up just like that. How many times do we do we uh, uh, despise our neighbors because they're not as knowledgeable in the Bible as we are? They can't quote John three sixteen like we can. They can't say the Lord's prayer like we can. They don't do it like we do. He goes on to say, he said, many despise their more ignorant neighbors who rest in a dead form of godliness, yet they themselves trust in a form of knowledge equally void of life and power. While some glory in the gospel or good news, their unholy lives dishonor God and cause his name to be blasphemed. You know, I just got word the other day that a, a so-called brother uh, back over in Kansas had uh, been, a, been a, a, a beating his wife and using her as a punching bag. Man, your religion's vain, dude. You know, faith without works is dead. That's not how we show the love of God. Because that violates Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul said, uh, 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 Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, you, uh, several years back, uh, an independent Baptist pastor was having sexual relations with one of his teenagers in his church actually took her across state lines and and his his church secretary actually delivered her to the place where they were to meet they were they were having such a such a, a romantic relationship that while one of their youth conferences was going on they were having relations in his office while the actual conference was taking place and the preaching and singing was going on I mean that's just one or two stories you know we hear of ministers and pastors that steal from their churches and steal from their ministries and and uh, uh, I was I was over I was down in the mountains uh, last week or a week and a half ago and uh, was got up in the morning was doing some work and and uh, a guy by the name of Peter Popoff found him on the TV and he was selling these little bottles of miracle spring water Miracle Spring Water. And, and you can buy that, send in a donation and get that Miracle Spring Water and miracles are happening. And these people were being interviewed. I bought me some Miracle Spring Water and I got $150,000. I got a brand new job. I got this. I got that. Where is all that found in Scripture? Those are charlatans. Those are, those are deceivers. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, are entered, entered to the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out demons? Have we not done many wonderful works? Have we not played Benny Hinn and blew on people? And he'll say, then, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work lawlessness or iniquity. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. What kind of heart do you have? Do you have a soft heart, tender heart? Do you have a pliable heart? Do you have a circumcised heart? Do you have a heart that's open to know truth? And once you know truth, to change in order to please our God? 
Or do you have a hard heart and stiff-necked heart? I come up with a new word before I left Kansas, stiff-neckedness. Do you have a do you have a stiff heart, hard heart, a deceitful heart? You know, Jeremiah, Jeremiah said there uh, in Jeremiah 17, 9, said the heart is uh, deceitful and desperately wicked. Do you, do you mislead? Have, have you misled others? Have you misled yourself? Are you fooling yourself? You've talked yourself into a salvation experience. You've talked yourself into a faith that's not there. You've manufactured something that's not there. You've talked yourself into, oh, well, I remember I went down in Sunday school and I prayed and I asked the Lord to save me. Or I, 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 I was at a revival meeting and I went down to an altar, to an altar call, and I prayed and asked the Lord to save me. Or I was baptized to, into the first self-righteous church. Or I was this, or I was... Uh, have, have you deceived yourself? Have you told yourself a lie and you've deceived yourself and fooled yourself to where you believe something that's not even true? Do you have a hard heart? Are you hard-hearted towards the truth? And others that may know more than you do. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful. I, I, I get accused all the time of being a know-it-all. Boy, I tell you what, if I'm wrong, I want somebody to tell me. I want somebody to tell me. I want them to show me in love so that I can write the course. You know, a sailor gets out on the ocean and he, don't, he, he just don't let the wind take him where he wants to. Sometimes he has to adjust his course. Pilots have to adjust their course when they're flying in order to stay on course. They have to adjust. Their, hey, in our life, there's many pitfalls, many obstacles, many things that get in the way. We have to adjust our course. There's things we're going to do that's wrong, we're going to say wrong, we're going to believe wrong. We need to know the right things. And I, and I thank God for people that pull pull me aside and say, Brother, I don't think that you were correct on that. Let's, let's look at that. Man, I, I praise God for that. I do. But do you have a hard heart and you, you're not open to change and open to truth and, and open to, to, to the blessings the absolute manifold blessings for those who will just be obedient to the faith. What kind of heart do you have? You know, Yahweh looked on David's heart and he saw a heart that was, that was, at the, uh, uh, that was after the things of God. Did David sin? Oh yeah, David made some serious mistakes. David made some serious mistakes, but hey, was he still a man after God's own heart? Yes, he was. Was he still blessed? Yes. And hey, guess what throne is still going to be established in the kingdom? The throne of David. Let us pray that we may be made real Christians, real believers, real followers, true believers, not outwardly. Now, once it's on the inside, it, it's going to come out, okay? But it don't start from the outside. It's got to start from the inside. It's got to start from the inside. See, man, we can dress up the outside all day long. We can look like a Christian. We can act like, we can talk like a Christian, dress like a Christian. Yeshua called them wolves in sheep's clothing. We can put on all the outside stuff. But if it ain't in your heart, it's like you can put on you can put on a fireman's outfit and a hat and get on the truck. But if it ain't in your heart to grab that hose and go fight that fire, uh-uh. You can wear your camouflage fatigues and your boots and your hat, and you can carry your AR-15 and walk around like a like a tough guy. But when the fighting starts, if your heart ain't in it, you're going to be gone. It's that simple. Is your heart truly into the things of God? Let us pray that we may be real Christians, true believers, not outwardly, but inwardly, in the heart and spirit, not in the letter, baptized not with water only, but with the Holy Spirit of God. And let our praise be from him, not from men. Remember the two that went to the wall to pray? The Pharisee and the publican? 
The Pharisees said, Oh, great God in heaven, I thank God that I'm not like this publican. I tithe of all that I have. I pray three times a day. I go to the synagogue. I go to here. I, I go to there. I'm a, I'm a deacon at this church, and I, I, I have this, uh, this ministry over here, and I, I, I do all this thing. And, and Yeshua said he just got his reward looking for the praise of men. What do you say there in Matthew 23? That they, they look to sit in the uppermost seats in the synagogues and they want to be called rabbi, rabbi, pastor, reverend, minister, father. They got their reward. But the publican, the publican was so repentant and so ashamed of his sin and of his condition that the Bible says he wouldn't even lift up his head, but he, he, he beat on his chest and have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, that's the kind of heart that the Lord's looking for. That repentant, that penitent heart. That heart that is pliable and usable and circumcised heart. Not a heart of stone, but the heart of flesh that's circumcised. May we have a desire to please our Heavenly Father out of a heartfelt respect for Him and a desire to please Him. I want you to look in Psalm 73, verse 1, and we're going to look at a couple verses of Scripture and then we're going to close in prayer. Psalm 73 and verse number 1. <clears throat> the Psalm of Asaph, it says, Truly, Elohim or God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. In the book of 1 Peter, or 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 16, go back a little farther. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 7, the passage of scripture we were talking about when Samuel found David. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 said, But Yahweh said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh seeth not, man, not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looketh on the heart. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse number 4, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 4, said, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, talking about the ladies. It's in context here. Meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of Elohim of great price. The hidden man of the heart. Is your heart really in it? What kind of heart do you have today? My prayer is that, that you have a heart that's pleasing to the Lord and have a desire to walk out and to serve him and be obedient to his commands. Remember, Paul's letter is about obedience to the faith because the lawful shall live by faith. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the study. I pray for those who are listening. Speak to hearts and do what needs to be done. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, we pray these things. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number six, we're gonna close out with our Shema reading. Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6, those of you that don't, don't know what the Shema is, it's the hear and obey. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the hear and obey. We'll read verses 4 through 9. Follow along with me in your Bible, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one. And thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Numbers chapter number 6, Abraham and, and his great prayer, where he says, Yahweh bless thee and keep thee, Yahweh make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee 
and give thee peace. Shalom, my friends. We love you all. Thank the Lord for you. Hey, don't forget, daylight savings time this weekend. Spring ahead. You're going to lose that hour. Hey, at least it's after Sabbath. Amen. Praise the Lord. You guys have a great, great week. Enjoy the remainder of your Sabbath. We'll see you next, next time. May the Lord bless you is our prayer.